The American guitarist John Fahey was once described by a Village Voice critic as the Clint Eastwood slash Steve McQueen of guitar. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Getting settled in here. Hope you're doing well. Today I'm going to review Dance of Death, The Life of John Fahey, American Guitarist, by Steve Lowenthal. Steve Lowenthal is an author and runs the label VDSQ, which specializes in solo instrumental acoustic guitar music. His first book is this biography of the eccentric guitar legend John Fahey, who between 1959 and 2001 made almost 40 albums. Of course, as these things go, Steve stumbled into something mysterious and inexplicable during the writing of this book. John Fahey, in his own way, had predicted the future. He foresaw that Steve would be studying him. In the introduction, and I live for stuff like this, Lowenthal shares his eerie discovery. One particularly obscure LP was 1965's The Transfiguration of Blind Joe Death, my favorite actually, which included a 30-page booklet written by Fahey that same year. In this text, he, as an unnamed omni omniscient narrator, tells the hallucinatory tale of a student researching his master's thesis on John Fahey. 1965, when he wrote this. The student finds a shopkeeper and asks, did you ever go to any of the clubs around Boston during the 60s and perchance see or hear of a guitar player named John Fahey? I need any information I can get on him for my master's thesis. I'm doing it on pre-second foundation artistically creative geniuses. From there, the student has sent to meet a series of Fahey's associates and lovers, a bizarre maze of fantastically surreal characters. The student, who is continually referred to throughout the text as insipid and stupid, eventually finds Fahey trapped in a cave, and becomes trapped himself. While I certainly recognize a strange coincidence here, it became even odder once I realized that the story was set in 2010, and that Fahey had made the protagonist Jewish. I had, quite unwittingly, stepped into a prophesied role, created by John Fahey himself. John predicted that I was coming and had laid all the traps and mazes for me decades earlier. I took it as a sign I was on the right track. This is a YouTube channel about books, but when I get a chance to speak about music I love, I'm very excited to do so. If you research a little bit, you'll probably hear John Fahey described as folk, but there's very little about John Fahey that ties in with the whole hippie folk genre of his era. John Fahey was playing outsider music before there was such a thing as outsider music. He jokingly referred to his style of playing as American Primitive. The label stuck. He would have benefited tremendously from having been born in the era of punk rock or industrial noise or all of the experimental stuff on the cusp of the late 70s, early 80s. That would have definitely been his time. As it turns out, he was born about 40 years earlier and was around and playing for, much to his chagrin, the hippie audiences, which punk rockers later sought to slaughter. In fact, John Fahey has much more in common with something like black metal. And I know that may sound strange, but check this out. I never thought I would get the chance to speak about this juxtaposition, which ever since I discovered it, I always thought was fascinating and made total sense. This is an acoustic guitar player named Chris Brokaw covering this very obscure French black metal band named Vlad Tepish. I've known about this song for years, but of course in writing this review, I discovered that uh, Chris Brokaw, this guitarist, has an album on this author's label, on Steve's label, VDSQ. Of course, not surprising. So that's kind of what it's like. It doesn't make sense at first, but then it totally does. To me, Fahey's guitar, Fahey's music sounds like the cycle of death, the minutia of chemical degradation and birth that is part and parcel of a whole organic cycle, inhuman but greater, 
expansive and intimate, vicious and forgiving, primal, deep, playful and serious in the same notes. It's almost overly sentimental, but it never quite crosses that line. And instead hits you so hard and deep in that authentic place in your solar plexus. And real quick, that lump in your throat shows up and it's just overwhelming. The music sounds like it was written by an ascetic hermit living in the mountains who just lost the only person he ever loved and who ever loved him. John never learned to play sheet music and claimed that for every note there was an image going through his head which is really fascinating to me. He was much more concerned with tone and emotion as opposed to technique. He was, he was really into ideas and you know, and you can see it when he's playing, you know, he's kind of like doing like this sort of trance thing, you know, and he actually later on to get over the stage fright, he, he tried to, uh, he went to a hypnotist and he actually, there's an interview where he discusses it and he, you know, he, so every time he touches the guitar, he kind of goes into sort of like this trance and you can see it while he's playing when he's really losing himself and his head's just kind of like bobbing up and down, you know, and uh, he's off somewhere else in the good moments. And those, you know, you can recognize that in yourself when you're not self-conscious, that's sort of how it feels. Certainly John was one strange, unique, mythological character. We'll come back to that word mythological later. But he actually came from the lily white suburbs of Maryland. It all began when he heard Jimmy Rogers' Blue Yodel number seven on the radio. And I love the description of when he hears it for the first time. This is what he said his reaction was when he heard this for the first time. He reached out and grabbed me and it has never let go of me, he remembered. I went limp. I almost fell off the sofa. My mouth fell open. My eyes widened and expanded. I found myself hyperventilating. I screamed for help, but nobody was around and nobody came. Nothing has ever been the same since. I love that, being so arrested by a piece of music that you're like, you're paralyzed, it must be terrifying. I mean, imagine being so moved by a piece of music that you're paralyzed physically, it's horrifying. So when he got older, he worked at a 24 hour gas station, selling his own records to whomever he could. Sometimes he'd slip it in with other records at the record store. He was a record collector and eventually, after discovering that he loved the old deep Southern blues guys, Fahey was partially responsible for this massive blues revival. When he went down south, trying to buy old records off of people, just trying to find these, you know, these, these recordings, because they weren't around, they weren't available. And he fell in love with people like Charlie Patton, Skip James, and Book of White. All of these blues legends had fallen off somewhere back in history. Even though their music sort of lived, nobody knew where they were. Until John Fahey and his friend went down south to the places that they were singing about in their lyrics and found them. <laughs> Fahey actually found his idol Skip James dying in the hospital from testicular cancer. Faye loved Skip James, and for good reason. I love Skip James. He's astounding. But when they found him, he was this mean old guy dying from this horrible disease. He was uh, pretty bitter, apparently. Things didn't really work out between them. Then again, given the shape he was in, maybe it's no surprise that he was not cooperative. I don't know. Now for a lot of you youngins, blues music sounds kind of old timey, but I mean it when I say this was the hardest shit around at the time. This music came from a place of deep frustration, like Fahey's, and he knew it, and it resonated with him. Fahey heard in the blues a rage not expressed elsewhere, and stories fascinated with death, violence, and sex. The reason I liked Charlie Patton and those other Delta singers so much was because they were angry, Fahey remembered. Their music is ominous. Patton had a rheumatic heart and you knew he was going to die young, which he did. In Sun House, you hear a lot of fear. In Skip James, you hear a lot of sorrow, but also a lot of anger. I played some of the records to the doctor and he said, these guys are angry as hell. And they are. You can listen to them. Book of White, another guy 
they found an incredible guitar player. Like, I'm like incredible. Uh, was actually uh, earlier in his life charged with murder and uh, recorded albums from prison. John found him working in a tank factory. So after John discovered these guys, he started recording his own material, and of course, you know, his cult following grew and grew. He would write these strange, semi-fictional stories in the liner notes of his albums, most of which centered around death in the early days. He created this mythology based around his blues persona, someone he named Blind Joe Death. And later, he would actually go to school and study philosophy and mythology, or, or folklore, maybe. And he wrote his masters on Charlie Patton, he had this obsession with the myths of blues musicians, and then created myths about himself inspired by those myths, only to have them be treated like he was treating the blues musicians, by people like Steve Lowenthal or myself. And now you can recognize this strange, humorous aspect of myth and folklore. The pieces form a view of Fahey from all angles, the professional, the myth, the collector, the romantic, the scholar, and form the sum total of his early American experience, the result sounds almost like a conversation the artist is having with himself, rearranging and editing the details of his life. All the while, the audience is privy to this process and its voyeuristic indulgence becomes a justification for Fahey's self-obsessions. After all, Fahey himself fantasized about his work being viewed with the same level of devotion as that of his idols. So he did his own version of a methodology, a working musicologist, and he did it on himself while creating the music at the same time. He was a prankster and a genius, definitely. But, of course, other side of the coin, he was somebody who never really grew up. And this was simultaneously why people loved and hated him. In his personal life, you know, according to many of his ex-wives or girlfriends, he was sort of like this giant baby that really just was incapable of taking care of himself. He had this hellish stage fright, yet he was just con yet he was convinced of his immense importance but at the same time hated playing live and avoided any kind of careerism like the plague, which seemed to be just as much from fear of rejection and laziness as it was from not wanting to be seen as an opportunist, from wanting to be kind of like, you know, a purist, an artist. There's a load of crazy stories in this book, I mean. <laughs> After he became well-known, the Italian filmmaker Michelangelo Antonioni, someone who I really appreciate, came to him and wanted him to score uh, a piece of his film, Zabriskie Point. So Faye said yes, they flew him over to Italy, and then he got cold feet and couldn't do it. So instead, Faye comes back and he makes up this story about punching Antonioni in the face during this political argument at a restaurant. I mean, you can believe what you want, but I, you know. Things, however, fell apart when the two went out to celebrate at an upscale restaurant and began to talk politics. Antonioni started discussing how his film was a critique of American culture which he thought was an abomination. In actuality, his and Fahey's views weren't that different. Fahey was actually very conservative, he, like, in the sense that like, he thought the left was like, totally like, inept and incompetent and just whiny at the time. Fahey was hypercritical of the counterculture himself and wondered how anyone could live with it. His hangers-on nodded in agreement. Yet Fahey resented the director's insinuation that Americans were unsophisticated and endlessly materialistic. Perhaps in Antonioni's world, this seemed the case, but Fahey resented the implied condescension. I felt that my intelligence was insulted, wrote Fahey, that qua musician I was being treated quite rudely and wrongly and unethically. I thought that this was an insult to my mind, my reality, my commitments, and everything that I was, and everything that I stood for. Despite his similar objections to excess and hedonism, Fahey decided he wanted nothing to do with what he perceived as an anti-American propaganda film. Being the patriot that he was, he felt it his duty to stand up and defend his homeland. The disagreement escalated and the two began shouting in the restaurant. Then Fahey punched the famed director in the face. The two never spoke again. <laughs> Fahey's music was cut from the film, though he was still paid for his work, and was replaced with Jerry Garcia and Pink Floyd songs. The film was considered a disappointment upon release, and Fahey felt vindicated by its commercial failure. So, that's actually not true, but <laughs> it's told, you know, uh, as if it was first, and then of course it goes on to say it was a product of Fahey's imagination. But, I, uh, for a second, I loved <laughs> believing that John Fahey went over to Italy and punched Michelangelo Antonioni in the face in public at a restaurant. I just... That's just such, man, if I, had, if I just had 
money, I'd go make a short film about that whole scenario. That's just so damn funny. He was fun, but Fahey was fundamentally, creatively uncompromising, right? To the point where he was a bitch to work with, but it really seemed like money did not mean much to him at all, whether he had it or not. I mean, we're talking about towards the end of his life after substance abuse and addiction and all this shit, like staying in like weak motels, you know, weekly motels, like these disgusting fucking places and uh, getting like offered this totally legitimate kind of awesome six figure deal and just not really caring and not wanting to go through with it and just say like, no, I'm going to sit here in my pile of, uh, you know, cardboard pizza boxes and just rot, you know, because uh, that doesn't sound like something I really want to do, you know, just even like even when he should have been desperate, you know, just really didn't care. Though in his romantic relationships, he was an obsessive if we're to trust the book, and he really never seemed to learn any better. You could have guessed, but this story doesn't end well, right? Sleeping issues, alcoholism, and again, this inability to care for himself, you know, he really was heavily dependent on others, and was really, like, starting to go crazy at several times in his life, and just like, you know, from sleeping pills and, and alcohol, like bolos of alcohol, and a shitty diet, and all of these things, you know? That stuff really ages you fast, man. And it's, it's amazing that he made it to 60. It's a triumph. It reminds me, tragically, like the fate of another brilliant guitarist named uh, Jackson C. Frank. I won't get into it, but his is a real sad story. But uh, just go check out, listen to uh, Blues Run the Game. In many ways, the narrative trajectory is very cliche. Yeah, but you hear some of that music, and it is really like nothing else you have ever heard. After reading Dance of Death, I come away convinced, as I've been by many books, that intense despair can create, for better or worse, intense beauty. Unable to articulate his emotional chaos with words, John Fahey did so immaculately with his music. But he's a dark guy and spent time mentally in a place that you do not want to spend time in. The void is a term you find in existentialist writers, and it's particularly well described by some Catholic mystics in books on contemplation. It's how you feel when the bottom drops out. It's worse than the blues. Some of the music I've written is a description of this state. It's from an interview you did in 1980. Yeah, the void. Stay away from the void. Like I said, again, his music is the cycle of life and death. More like death and life. And when he was near the end of his life, living in Salem, Oregon, which was about an hour and a half down the road from where I was growing up at the same time, he was just like the blues guys he discovered. People were buying the records and people assumed he was dead. It led to the obvious comparison of people thinking blues guys are dead. The parallels to Fahey's own discovery of Skip James were striking. In turn, Fahey himself became the keeper of lost secrets from the past. He seemed as alien to the alternative crowd as James had been to the folk revivalists. Even though he believed that ambition toward careerism was hollow, Fahey wanted to matter. That his music is continually discovered and enjoyed proves his enduring relevance. When people ask me how good I am, I usually cop to being brilliant, even better than that, but short of genius, Fahey wrote. But I say these things in an objective, dispassionate manner because... You know, I can't explain why, but being one of the greatest guitarists in the world simply is not very important to me. Oh, but if you took it away somehow, I would be very unhappy. If you like the blues, look up any of these artists. It's a great starting point. You know, uh, maybe get in there with some Robert Johnson, Skip James, Sun House, Book of White. Uh, who else? I don't know. Uh, Big Bill Brunzi, um, Howlin' Wolf. You look up any of these guys, one thing will lead to another, it'll all start, you know, you'll you'll fall down the rabbit hole and this one goes deep. You never know where he might come out or where it may lead. Enjoy the legend of Blind Joe Death. Always remember life is far too short to read bullshit. Hope you guys are doing well. Please subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter, get updates there, Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. Would really appreciate some Facebook likes. If you would like to help support the show, you can donate at patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and you can get access to my private vlog wherein I give updates about everything. And also this book club that I'm going to start wherein I'm going to tell all of my patrons who have donated a dollar or more what I'm reading and will eventually review so you can get a head start. Check it out. We can 
read along together and communicate. So you can have this dialogue leading up to the review. Always remember life is far too short to read bullshit. Hope you're doing well. It was great to see you. Take care. Talk to you soon. Ciao.